we're going to talk about time and why Albert Einstein called it an illusion. What is it actually and how we're supposed to be using it. Fact is, there are two brilliant people. I'm going to put them together. Niels Bohr and Buddha, Siddhartha. 2,500 years ago, Buddha said something that Niels Bohr, 2,500 years later or so, uh, linked together in a way that uh, makes perfect sense in the concept of time and what time is and what we're supposed to be doing with it. What Niels Bohr said is that the world that we're living in, that we consider to be real, cannot be regarded as real. Physicists have long since determined that this physical world is really an energy world. It's not what we think it is. And Bohr said that 100 years ago. This world that we think is real is not really real. Buddha said that once you understand the world's not real, you can escape suffering. Once you understand the world's not real, you can escape suffering. So Bohr, one of the smartest physicists ever, says the world's not real. Buddha says if you recognize that it's not real, you escape suffering. Well, my goodness, is there a lot of suffering going on in the world? Can we alleviate the suffering by understanding what the heck they're talking about? Absolutely. That's the point of this, linking these two guys together. And time fits into this equation. Now, Albert Einstein famously said that time is an illusion. That's just another way of saying it's not real or it's not what we think it is. What is an illusion? An illusion is something that has a deceptive appearance. It's there. It exists. It's just not what you think it is, okay? It has a deceptive appearance. Time has a deceptive appearance. It's not what we think it is. Somewhere in the 1960s, two brilliant men, uh, Wheeler and DeWitt, came along and developed equations. They were trying to unite uh, some concepts in physics, and they developed some equations that basically made time irrelevant. Kicked it out. It wasn't important for a bunch of different reasons, and I'm going to try to explain why that is. Again, this is amateur discussion about this, a therapeutic discussion. It's a healthy discussion to help people relieve suffering. This wouldn't pass any physicist's you know, test. Maybe it would, I don't know, but I'm not trying to impress physicists here. I'm trying to help alleviate suffering. I'm trying to help people see why time isn't what we think it is, okay? So any feedback from PhDs that I want to hear it, I do want people to see that time is an illusion and why that is. So I'm going to make an example of, from my understanding of what Wheeler and DeWitt and Einstein are talking about. It comes from something called superposition and the wave function concept of the world that we're living in. Now it's one of my favorite concepts called quantum foam, just a neat concept that basically describes the world is basically a whole bunch of possibilities like in a, in a like in a bathtub with a bunch of bubbles foam a bunch of bubbles and reality somehow underneath the foam and what we experience as as this world is above the foam and then there's some force that moves through the bubbles to to create this world the foam exists as potentials it's not really what we think it is and in that there's a way to think of it where time fits in where it doesn't really exist because all of, all of time exists right here and now. It really is the power of now. And the best way to think of it is using one of my favorite movies, Revolver. Very, very good uh, ego revelation type of movie. And if I were to show you the DVD and say the beginning, the middle, and the end of this video are all right here, right now, right? The beginning, the middle, and the end are all on this DVD. But when I put it into the TV and I play it, how do I experience it? Beginning, middle, end. Now I could pause it. I could even rewind it. I could actually set it aside in the beginning, in the middle, and the end. It's all right there, sitting there, waiting for it to be experienced. But when I put it into some sort of a machine, it unfolds in a linear fashion, and then you have an experience of a movie going from beginning to the middle to the end. Now, all the data of this movie is on this disc. All of it, right here, right now, all of the data is on the disc. And it's on there eternally, really, as long as I preserve the disc somehow. It's on here all the time, ready to be used whenever. Now, time is just the experience of the DVD when you're playing it in the system. If I'm not playing the DVD, time is not relevant to this DVD, because the beginning, the middle, and the end is all here, right here, right now. Time is only the appearance of the DVD unfolding. Now, if there were a pause button to the universe, I could pause and show you that right now. I mean, a rewind button. I mean, maybe somebody's got it out there. Maybe psychedelics help with that. But the fact is, 
the universe operates much like this DVD. All the data is already on there, beginning, middle, and the end. Another way to think of it is video games. Ever play a video game? I use Pac-Man. That's the one that people often, uh, everybody's heard of. Pac-Man, all the variations that Pac-Man can do is already there at the beginning of the video game. Some sort of programmer set it up that way. Then you go into the game and you have an experience. There's a the beginning of the game, there's your first screen, then there's a second level and a third level and all that kind of stuff. And then at some point the game ends. There might be someone in the world, somewhere in the world that someone's been playing the game for 40 years, maybe 30 years. I doubt it very much. My sister once played it for eight hours straight until my mother pulled the plug on her. Okay. Yeah, right. The fact is, you're going to start a game, there's going to be an ending to the game. Now, time has been described by these brilliant people as an emerging phenomenon. Time is an emerging phenomenon. That means it shows up when it wasn't there. If I haven't started Pac-Man, or if I haven't started the, a, a movie like Revolver, if you start it, this, the clock starts at zero. And then it goes to one second, and then two seconds, and three seconds. See, time emerges when I start playing the game. However long you're going to play Pac-Man is like that. I don't think there's a clock on Pac-Man, but plenty of video games have that. And a fabulous way to understand this is just thinking of football games or any sports that you, that you like. If we were to go to Heinz Field in a couple weeks, then Steelers are playing, and I were to look up at the clock, and it says 101. Does that mean lunch just ended? <laughs> now, if it's the game clock, what, what time could it be? Maybe it's Sunday night football and it's the fourth quarter and it's closer to midnight. That clock is relevant to the game that's being played. Now, before kickoff, is that clock started? No. It doesn't exist until the game starts, okay? Now, if you're not playing the game, the time's not relevant. There are people who aren't watching the game, they don't care about that time. If I could go to the other side of the world and they're watching a soccer game, they might have a clock going on over there that's completely not something that the Steeler fans aren't, aren't concerned with. So time emerges once a game starts, the way they've described it, these brilliant men, it, as an emerging phenomenon. It's basically, it's time exists inside systems of a sort. For time to exist, it must be inside a system. Well, we're, we have time. That means we must be in some sort of a system. So you've got the beginning of a game, the middle of a game, the end of a game, and even inside the game you have various other clocks, play clocks during the game, which is different than the clock of the game clock. See, the play clock is in different type of time that's relative to the thing that's happening in that moment, and yet that's inside of a system of the larger context of a bigger game. Another type of time shows up. And then you have the actual clock, that does tell you that it might be 1 or 1 p.m. So you've got three different types of time going on inside that. That's because there's a bunch of different systems going on inside there. Right? So we're living in a world like that, that if time shows up, that means you must be in some sort of a system. There's a beginning and a middle and the end, and it's all right here, right now. That's the power of now. And you're just experiencing it sequentially. So Einstein, 100 years ago, when he calls time an illusion, he explained it. It's more like space-time. Space is an illusion, too. We'll have other videos on that soon, about why the physical world is an illusion as well. But the time aspect of it that Einstein described as an illusion can be really well thought of as what happens in a movie, like during uh, a, a film strip type of movie, because you can understand it very well. Now, I've got this excellent drawing here. This is about as, as I worked hard on this. A drawing of a person waving their hands to say hi, okay? And what science has demonstrated in the superposition realm is that you have all these various possibilities in which a person could raise their hand, they could wave, they could raise their hand and, and uh, perhaps throw a football, they could maybe raise a hand with a gun in it, they could raise a hand and shoot a basketball, they could perhaps raise a hand and do an obscene gesture. I mean, how many different things can somebody do by raising their hand? All of those are possibilities. That's part of the quantum phone. Many different things you can do when you're raising hands. I'm very clean here, I'm just going to raise my hand and wave. That's what that is. Now, all of those things exist, and they're like snapshots of potential things that can happen. And when you think, when the conscious part of you, inside this illusion of a body, thinks, I'd like to raise my hand and wave to somebody, it actually acts like snapshots. If you can remember little flip books when you were a kid, 
and you draw a little uh, shape in a corner of, a, of a one page and then a shape on the next page and a shape on the next page and you flip it really quick, it looks like there's movement. But there's not really movement. It's an illusion. There's apparent movement. And so you go from one screen or the one piece of page to another piece of the page to another to another to another. And if you do it quick enough, it looks like a character's moving. So here, in just three images, you can go snapshot, snapshot, snapshot. And now it looks like this person is waving their hands. Okay? But it's really three different moments in time sliced together so fast that you cannot tell that there's actually no movement. It's like a 3D holographic image placed together so rapidly that it's apparent movement. Now, here's where time enters. The gap between these two film strips is actually a space. And that's what Einstein calls time. It's a dimension. The movement from this one to that one, if you will. Just like in a film strip in the movie theater, Going from one frame to the next frame to the next frame actually requires some form of physical movement. And the experience of one frame to the next to the next, the gap between the two, that's time. Now what we're doing as human beings having a, I should say as a spiritual beings having a human experience, what we're doing is perceiving this. I like to visualize it like this. If these are film strips, what gets the image on the film strip up on the screen? the light that goes through the film strip, okay? You, I'm gonna say soul for simplicity purposes. It's also shorter than the word consciousness, but consciousness works here too. You are moving through these film strips and you end up having an experience up on the screen called the movie of your life. Now you're having physical experiences for sure, but quantum foam, you know, all, all things are right here, right now. There's really no objective reality. Niels Bohr says what we call real is not really real. That means this stuff isn't even happening like we think at all. It's actually happening like this. You're having an experience of these film strips, and you are actually this line right here. You're the conscious experience of all of this. And if somewhere in this process you want to, instead of waving your hand, you want to place your hand down and pat your dog on the head. This is really bad. <laughs> I am a therapist, not an artist. This is a human being patting a dog on the head. But now, this was possible. This was possible. They both existed in quantum foam. This is what superposition is. Various possibilities. But as soon as you perceive something different, oh, here comes a dog. I'm going to pat it on the head. Now you have that experience, and the gap between this and this is also time. So the soul comes into the physical world, which is an illusion, and has a whole bunch of different experiences. Buddha says if you don't like your film strips and because you're suffering, recognize that what's going on isn't real. And then you will escape the suffering. Because you are this. You are the life force that's animating it. You're not the physical flesh illusion of a being on the film strip. No more than the person that's up on the movie theater is actually up on the movie theater. That's a representation of something, that, an image that was captured elsewhere. Well, that's what you are as well. And this process leads to an experience in which I'm going to end with these two, these two lines. One by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. He describes that time kills everything. Okay? That's because if we put enough of these film strips back to back, what happens over time? What happens to all of your desires and all of your goals? In The Course of Miracles it says time has two purposes. And the ultimate purpose is to learn how to escape from the madness of the suffering that we're living in. They call it the holy instant. In any moment when you wake up to this reality, that you're this spiritual being having this physical experience, the suffering ceases. That doesn't mean it's fun and you still might be sad. But the quality of suffering that we feel when we think the world is physically real, that's what goes away. And so time kills everything. All your hopes and all your dreams and everything that you're working for, given enough illusion of a time, guess where we all end up? In a box or cremated somewhere, right? That's totally depressing if that's what you're doing with time. You know, gee, let me work on getting elected president or make a million dollars or win five Super Bowls or whatever. It's going to end up dead. And that's one use of time. Go for it. Lots of people have been trying that. It doesn't work that well. But there's a second use of time. 
In Ephesians 5.16, it says, to make the best use of time, because days are evil. Okay? Make the best use of the time that you've got here, because days are evil. Well, why are days evil? Days are human constructs. Days are things that the ego thinks of. Okay? Days are evil because they're not what we think they are. They are physical world representations, and that's what's the evil. The spiritual world, as Jesus says in John 6, 63, the spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. So time does exist. It exists as a construct, and we're supposed to use it intelligently. Make the best use of your time. Don't just come down here and use your time for physical gain to wave your hand and pat dogs on the head. Oh, you could do that, and there's nothing wrong with it. That's giving to Caesar that which is Caesar's. But do with time what you're supposed to be doing with time. Waking up, expanding your spiritual skill set, having an experience, helping others wake up, recognizing what time is. The word Buddha itself means to wake up to the true nature of reality, ultimately. Jesus demonstrated, you know, when he says, today you'll be with me in paradise, on the cross, he recognized, that's because it's time, is it today you'll be with me in paradise? Because the moment you understand what's going on, you're free. You're gone. That's also the holy instant. You're free. Just recognizing that. In the Tibetan Book of the Dead, it says about 20 times that recognition and liberation are simultaneous. Also the holy instant. The moment you recognize what's going on, that you're living in this an illusion of time, an illusion of space, you're having a spiritual experience, once you recognize that, you're liberated. Your suffering ceases. That's the best use of time. Use it well. Wake up. Spread the spirit to each other. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We know this physical game ends. Help each other wake up. Add to your soul if that works for you. I think of it as like going to a gymnasium. Souls come here to have a physical world experience. You're given a certain number of hours, just like you are at a gym. Gym closes at 9 p.m. Better get your last run in, right? Put the weights away, please. That's the same thing in the physical world. Given about 80 years, give or take. Get your work in. Get your workout in. That's what you're here to do. It's a spiritual workout. If I'm at the gym, the weights are valuable, creates resistance, so I can develop my muscles. Well, that's the physical world we're in. We're having a physical world experience, and there's a lot of weights around. Use them. Lift your weights. Develop the soul muscles. Get flat abs. Get a, get a, work on getting a good head of hair, spiritually speaking, right? Look beautiful spiritually. Go to a gym and work out. That's what you're supposed to be doing. But recognize it's just a gymnasium. It's not your true home. The spiritual home elsewhere outside this dimension that we're living in. We've all taken a right turn, if you will, into this illusion of a world, and we're having a physical world experience that's much like a gymnasium for your soul. Make good use of it. If I go to a gymnasium, I'm there to work out. I don't go there to eat donuts and pizza and sit around, right? I guess some people might do that. That would be a bad use of gym time, right? Come to the physical world, make the best use of time, is to come get a good spiritual workout in. How do we do that? That's the fruits of the Spirit. That's the virtues. That's practicing forgiveness. That's working on patience. That's developing hope. That's, uns that's uh, resolving or solving the mystery, the riddle that we're in. What is the nature of reality? We have the ability to do that. What a fascinating game that is. Don't waste any time on that. Weave that into every part of your day. Learn the mysteries. I know there's a line in the Old Testament about that, too. How deep, how deep can you go with the mysteries of God? There's a lot of different layers here. That's the good use of time. Because we're all going to end this game, just like Revolver ends or Pac-Man ends or any football game ends. Your game is going to end, but it's just a game. Recognize it's just a game, and who and what you really are, that's what ends the suffering. Bohr said it's an illusion. It's not real. Buddha says if we realize that, you don't suffer anymore. Go watch a scary movie or a sad movie. You have the experience of the movie, but since you knew it wasn't really real, it doesn't impact you. You don't watch a movie where somebody dies and go to a funeral. Understand what it is. Experience it like you're supposed to. Get your good spiritual workout in.